Hello. Hello. Uh, hello. 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 Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're about to get started soon, but um, glad you're joining us. Ooh, okay, Prati. I think I think we can start officially. Um. All right. Can everyone see this? Yep. So hello everyone, welcome to our series where you get a chance to meet a space professional. And this event is being hosted by Indus Space and Astro STEM Labs. We at Indus Space would like to acknowledge the various indigenous lands we reside on as an organization. This includes the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. We would also like to thank our sponsors, Ontario Regional Malayali Association and Stonehaven Dentistry for supporting our new endeavor. Uh, so a little bit about the host. So Indispace is a social enterprise with headquarters in Mississauga, Ontario. Indispace raises awareness specifically about space exploration and its connections to science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics for youth educators and the general public. We provide programs and products for all grade levels. Astro STEM Labs is an after-school STEM club based in Mississauga, Ontario. Astro STEM, Astro STEM Labs' this mission is to make learning of STEM subjects fun and exciting to children in grades 1 to 12. They conduct uh, online coding, robotics, engineering, math, science, and chess classes for kids across Canada. Uh, you can follow us on our website, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And please tag us with hashtag CDN Space Talks. So this is a reminder that this event is being recorded. So if you do not want to be recorded, you can uh, shut off your camera. Uh, and if you leave your camera on, then that means you do consent to being recorded. If you have any questions through for our speaker throughout the entire talk, please submit them at slider.com. Our code is Space Talks. I will also include the link in our Zoom chat window afterwards. Um, and some basic ground rules is that everyone should listen closely and respectfully, ask questions when you're curious or confused, uh, keep your questions and comments short, especially when you type them up, and most importantly, have fun. So here are our speakers for the remainder of August. So next week we uh, and the upcoming weeks. So next you can hear from uh, here in the deep. Um, and today we have Dr. Uh, Lori Rousseau Nepton. Uh, she is a resident astronomer at the Canadian or at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. She's the first indigenous indigenous woman in Canada to receive her PhD in astrophysics. She received her diploma from Laval University by studying regions of stellar formation in spiral galaxies. She's now leading an international project called Signals, aiming at observing thousands of newly born stars in galaxies close to the Milky Way to understand how birthplace affects the rest of their lives and the galaxy's evolution. Tonight, she will talk to us about the birth of stars in our backyard and in the nearby universe. Feel free to add questions on Slido, and we will have time towards the end for question, uh, questions. Awesome. Thank you. And hi, everybody. I am super happy to be uh, connected with you guys remotely. <laughs> so uh, I am currently in Hawaii. So for me, it is 11 a.m. in the morning. Uh, I have still my coffee beside me. And um, yeah, there's six hours uh, for 
from here to the east coast of Canada. And if you're closer to the west coast, then we have just a few hours between us. So I have this presentation today. I'm going to talk about my science, uh, how I do uh, astronomy here in Hawaii, and also how I became an astronomer. So I hope you enjoy it. And please ask me tons of questions. I love answering questions. And I will start sharing my screen. I have a lot of nice images to show you, um, including images from the telescope here. Uh, so uh, yeah, the, the, actually the images that you see right now, if you see them well, I hope you see them. If you can see them, just uh, send me some thumbs up. <laughs> so I'm sure it works. It's, it's, it's visible. <laughs> awesome. So um, uh, I'm from Canada. I'm from the east coast of Canada, from Quebec. Uh, my first language is French. You might notice I have a French Canadian accent when I talk. <laughs> and um, I moved here about four and a half years ago now. Uh, so I studied astronomy, uh, got my degree, and was hired here uh, to work at the, at the telescope. So that, that those two images behind, you have one of the observatory that I used to train uh, as the student. It's the Montmagantic Observatory. It's in Canada. And uh, of course, the Canada France Hawaii telescope right here, the one I work for right now, and it's the one behind me in, that, in this picture. So, how did I become an astronomer, and why was I so interested in astronomy? So, this is a picture of me when I was super young. Uh, I was fishing with my dad, and that hasn't changed. I still love to go fishing. Every year, I go back to Canada uh, in uh, in the fall. We go fishing, but we also go hunting. A big fan of uh, spending time in the nature and actually this is where my journey started spending a lot of times outdoor uh, with my dad and that's how I discovered I was super curious about everything uh, I wanted to understand everything around me and I think this is what led me to be an astronomer today <laughs> and back then I didn't even know what was astronomy um, I didn't even know you could do that as a career. <laughs> uh, I learned that way later, but I was so curious about the universe, the environment, the planets, how everything works. And um, so I'm uh, a member of a uh, First Nation in Canada uh, from the Pequacamianuats Nation. In Quebec, our community is located right here by a very large lake. Uh, it's the Pequagami Lake. It's a, actually a a, an Inu name that means a deep lake. <laughs> um, and I go back every year to see my family who lives nearby Quebec City. We go often to the reserve up there. And when we go hunting, we go even further north uh, in an area that is called the Shwapmushwan. And that's another Inu name uh, that means where we go wait for the moose. <laughs> and so I go with my family. We have a camp. It's very remote. And we go hunting and fishing. Uh, I get to see wolf tracks, uh, like the one on the image there, and I get also sometimes to find very special objects, like this arrowhead that I found in the lake when, um, when a year ago. And this is my favorite place in the world because um, it is super remote, and when I spend time out there, I get to look at things and also question myself how things work. <laughs> and um, when we are hunting, um, there's a lot of uh, the time that we spend trying to understand our environment, trying to see signs that there's a moose around. It could be freshly graves leaf like this one here. Uh, it could be tracks. We sometimes can take pictures of them with cameras that are hidden. And we do all this to understand how they behave and, and, and be good hunters. And as a scientist, I'm still doing and using those skills today. So uh, this year, uh, last year, actually, I was the lucky hunter in my family. We only uh, gather one moose a year for multiple families because uh, we don't need more. And as soon as the, there's one hunter that takes one moose, we are done. <laughs> and I was the lucky one. I went all the way up to that mountain in the back there, and I was able to find a moose there. I was super happy. I was alone, and it was the first time for me uh, doing this alone. <laughs> and, um, and then... So as I grew up, uh, I knew I was going to be a scientist because I was asking so many questions. And so um, when I uh, started going at the university, I decided to study physics. Uh, physics is a science. Uh, I was actually super intrigued also with biology, chemistry, and other science. But I picked physics because 
uh, it's the science that try to understand the world around us and the great forces in the universe and everything that comes with understand how those uh, forces work, like gravity uh, that we feel every day. <laughs> and this picture is actually a picture of um, the astronomy group at the University of Laval. Um, and I was right here <laughs> in the middle. I was a student. Uh, there was a bunch of student professors that were doing research in different topics. And um, when I had to pick uh, a research topic, um, I also had to pick someone uh, that would be willing to teach me through graduate school. So after doing a physics degree, um, I decided to do a master in astronomy. And I went to see the only female in the department, which is named Carmel Robert. She's right there. Uh, she was my astronomy teacher. She was my math teacher. I, I had met her in many classes. And I went to knock at her door, uh, the door of her office. And I, 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 tell, I told her, well, Carmel, I think I want to do a project in astronomy. I love space. I want to understand how it works. Uh, I love studying stars. And back then, they had a super interesting project for me. So they were building um, an, a, a prototype. So it was a, a camera that was going to be installed at Moming Galaxy Observatory on the telescope in Canada. And it actually was already started. So some engineer student had already put together the instrument uh, or the camera. And uh, I was going to be the first to try to observe galaxies with it. And uh, this is a picture of Laurent Brissel. Uh, he was the researcher leading that effort and building that instrument with some students. And I joined their group uh, under the supervision of Carmel and where I was going to use that prototype camera for the first time on the sky, trying to see if the camera could observe galaxies. And this camera is actually super special. It is unique. There's no other camera like that in the world, but there's a second one. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that second one now because it's with me in Hawaii. But it was the first one back then. <laughs> and what it is doing that is very special is that it is gathering the light coming from space. With the telescope, we have, we have this big mirror that collects the light. And depending on what the light, where the light comes from or where, what kind of material it goes through, we see different things. And we can study that and we can understand uh, those different objects. And so, of course, in the universe, we have multiple things that are super bright, that emits a lot of light, like stars and galaxies. And then the light can sometimes go directly into your telescope. And then what you can see with this very special instrument is not only a picture, but we call, what we call a spectra or a rainbow, if you like. So it is able to split the light in all its colors, and then you see a rainbow. And sometimes the light coming from space go through gas in space. There's some diffuse particles of gas everywhere. We call them clouds or, or nebulae. And when they do so, it changes what you see. So the gas, the fact that there's some particles along the line, <laughs> it changes the rainbow you see. So this is an example where you see those dark lines. It means you went through gas. And it not only means that, it also tells you a little bit about that gas. So it can tell you about what is actually that gas made out of. And another thing that is even more important and uh, is super related to what I do, sometimes you're actually looking directly into the gas. So instead of looking at the light coming from a star behind it, going through the gas, you're actually looking directly into the gas and the, the gas itself emits some light. And then you see something that is not just like a full rainbow, but more like with lines like this of uh, different colors. And this is like a fingerprint of what kind of gas it is. So you can do so many more science with these kinds of uh, instruments that split the light in the different colors. So that's what um, that instrument called Espion was doing. This is a couple of examples of different uh, um, rainbow coming from different stars. They all look slightly different with different patches of dark area. And, um, and so depending on where you look at, what kind of stars you're looking at, you can identify different um, different components uh, of those stars. It could be hydrogen, oxygen, iron, calcium. There's all of these things inside stars and inside the gas in space. 
So it was super exciting. And I was to use that instrument at the moment, Galaxy Observatory. Um, I was going to learn how to use it. I was going to test it. And I was going to see if we could do science with it. Are we going to be able to see those signature of elements in space with the camera, the prototype camera? And uh, on that picture over here, I was with other students. And at that time, as I was actually uh, a very, very good uh, observer. I had learned a lot, spent many, many nights observing. And I was actually teaching other students to do it as well. And it turned super well. <laughs> so uh, we got data. We were able to prove that this very special camera was working. <laughs> and we got some money uh, in order to build a new one a bigger one, a better one that would come here in Hawaii and be installed at a large, on, a, on a larger telescope and be accessible for a lot of researchers around the world. And this camera is now called CITEL. This is like the second version of, of that first prototype I was working on during my graduate school. And so I helped building it. This is a picture of my friend Julie. She was the lead engineer building the second camera. Um, we had it in a lab for a very long period of time where we put everything together and then eventually it was shipped uh, to the university at first <laughs> and I was there uh, gladly waiting for it and we got it delivered and we put it in a very large room in um, the civil engineer department, a department full of engineers and they have their gigantic freezers and uh, we could test if the camera would be able to work at minus 20 degrees C at like super cold condition. Because sometimes here on the summit of the mountain, it gets super cold. So we wanted to make sure it would still work in a very cold environment. So we put it in a freezer, that large freezer, we turn it on and we take some tests with it to make sure it was fine. And it, and it, and it did. <laughs> so for a couple of weeks, I was testing the camera in that huge freezer. And then we shipped it to Hawaii and we, we also flew in Hawaii with the instruments to, to, to test it with the, the team. And back then, uh, this was the weather forecast for the week we were supposed to test still on the telescope. So there was a huge hurricane uh, called Yermo <laughs> uh, that was uh, going towards the islands of Hawaii right there. And uh, we thought, oh my God, this is going to be like the worst, we won't be able to see the sky. We're gonna have this huge hurricane, but like in a very um, uh, unexpected way, the hurricane Guillermo decided to go completely north and miss the islands. And we had seven days of clear sky to do our observation. And the first object we observed uh, was one of those uh, clouds of gas that I was talking about. Uh, it looks a little uh, dark here um, and that's what actually most of the images that we take look like. They are like black and gray, uh, sometimes a little bit of white. But uh, once we analyze those data, we can make pretty images with them. So uh, that's actually an image of the real nebulae um, that we were observing. It's a nebulae around the star. There's a lot of gas around that star. We don't see that star. It's a tiny, tiny one. It's in the middle there. But there was also on that image, a galaxy in the background right there there's a galaxy and this is what i was interested in and i was analyzing the data in the background you can see me there with my computer and i was already checking out if we had good signals and good data and the first uh images i was able to, to do with that galaxy oh is there a question Okay, I, I could just hear some background. So I was looking into that galaxy. I could see how it was moving, it's turning on itself. And I could also see what kind of elements was hidden in there. And in the very center of the galaxy where it looks red, um, there was more uh, heavy elements like iron uh, contained in the center of the galaxy than there is in the outer part of the galaxy where it's bluer. I was super excited. And um, during the time I spent there, um, I also got to know people that are working here and I got back to Quebec, got, got back to Canada and uh, did my final exam to get my PhD. Uh, and this is a, the, a picture of the day of my graduation in January 2017. And uh, I was there with my uh, supervisor, Carmen Robert, and other students uh, studying with her. And I was super happy. <laughs> and um, I don't know if you hear the background, I have some, some uh, yeah. There's some action uh, in the town where I am right now. Okay. <laughs> and so right after I finished and I graduated, um, 
I was hired to be an astronomer here. So I moved, I packed all my stuff, and I moved with my two cats in Hawaii uh, to start working here. And so this is where I'm from, and this is where I landed on the big island of Hawaii. Uh, there's multiple islands in Hawaii, big island or the island of Hawaii is the largest one, of course. And it is a very special island. It has volcanoes. It has very large mountain. The one uh, where our telescope is on is called the Mauna Kea. This is a picture of the Mauna Kea in the winter. There's snow at the summit, even though we're in Hawaii where it's warm. And believe me, everywhere on the island else than the summit of the mountains, it is very warm. We have uh, 30 degrees Celsius all year long. There's almost no season elsewhere, but the summit gets snowy during the winter. And what I like about this image is that you can see that clouds are usually below the summit. So even if it's cloudy out there, you usually have clear sky when you're up the summit and the telescope can see the sky at all time. And this is a picture from uh, the mountains during the summer. I've seen where we're seeing the other side of it and you can still see some of the telescope up there. And those are volcanoes, right? So the Mauna Kea is not an active volcano. It's not erupting right now, uh, but there are some volcanoes that are active on this island. Um, and sometimes we have eruptions and things like that. And you can see also the ground is very red and brown. This, this is lava rocks. Uh, everywhere on the island you have it. It's uh, from previous eruption everywhere. And you see here, this is a really actually a picture taken at the summit of the Mauna Kea. You have multiple telescopes. The one in the very center is the Canada France Hawaii telescope. We have the best spot. <laughs> and uh, we can see the Gemini telescope here. You have the Keck telescope. There's a Subaru telescope. And each telescope um, is a partner, like it's like a collaboration between different countries. So here we are, of course, Canadian, France, and Hawaii, the US, uh, collaborating in this telescope, but each telescope uh, have different partners. Um, so uh, for example, uh, Subaru has a lot of people from Japan. There's some people from the UK, I think. And the Keck uh, telescope is mainly the US, India, and uh, and then you have Gemini, I'll see that is uh, also that is a little bit Canadian and other countries. So a lot of uh, different teams doing different science because they don't have the same cameras. <laughs> like Sidel. And this is um, a plain view of the summit. And uh, you see, this is the big uh, Mauna Kea. And uh, if we check out the very summit, we can see the telescope from above. Uh, and we call this area the Science Reserve uh, at the very summit of the mountain. OK, now focus on, uh, let's focus in, into a little bit uh, of uh, the telescope. So we see here the building. We have uh, what we call the catwalk around here, where we can go around and check out the view. <laughs> you can see, again, the, the clouds are below. Uh, so often when you drive up there, you have to cross through the clouds. We have the dome, the gigantic dome. Uh, and you have some people here that helps you uh, uh, imagine the size of it. And we have little windows. And now we're going to get inside. Um, to see the telescope. So this is, again, a, a plain view of the telescope. And um, I'm going to show you a side view here with someone right there. And I'm going to also show you a video of how everything moves, because a telescope can point on sky in any direction to allow you to see any star or galaxy you want to observe. And so at the beginning of the night, when the sun is setting or close to the sunset, uh, we, have, we have a telescope operator that's going to open the dome slit. So that's this big slit over here. It's opening. It takes one or two minutes. Uh, and it allows the cool air from outside to get inside the dome. Um, the operator is going to also open the little windows on the side to let the air flow in. It's actually super important to keep the telescope uh, very cold. Uh, if the telescope was warm, uh, it would uh, create like some turbulence on the, on the top of the telescope, like you see over a barbecue in the summer. <laughs> and that is not good to take pictures of stars. Uh, you don't want those turbulence above. And you just saw the dome rotating right now. So the dome rotates uh, and then the telescope can uh, point at the sky. And right now it's tilting uh, towards us so we can see the mirror. I'm going to pause it right there. At this moment, we see the mirror at the base of the telescope. It's actually the most important part of it. 
It's a gigantic mirror. It's 3.6 meter wide. So probably as big as the room you guys are in. And this is the part that collects the light coming from space. And the light, you can imagine the light coming from space, getting into the telescope, going over that mirror. It is reflected, it's bouncing back up. Uh, and the light gets again onto that tiny little part up above. It's focused there and there's another mirror hidden there that send the light back down. And the first mirror is actually in the shape of a donut. So there's a hole in the center. So the light is focused up, then beam down into that donut hole and it goes through and in the very back of the telescope, we put our camera that collects the light. So you can see it as like a gigantic human eye collecting a lot of light. So you can see things with a telescope, you cannot see with your eyes, definitely collects so much light. <laughs> and so we're at the summit of the Mauna Kea, we're on the island of Hawaii. So sometimes we do have volcano eruptions and earthquakes and we have to deal with these. <laughs> uh, sometimes we have lightnings and I have a video of lightnings falling on the other telescope right beside us uh, during a storm. Uh, that is not, not, not super, <laughs> super ideal, <laughs> but we have a team of engineers that can fix, uh, if there's any problem that arises, they can fix it. So they go up and then they, they make the camera work again. Um, and now this video shows our cloud cam. It's a camera outside um, that take videos of the night sky. And you can see the motions of the stars above the Mauna Kea. You can see the clouds below. You can see some light pollution from the towns. Um, sometimes there is a plane flying by. You can see them also flying across. And of course, this is accelerated. The sky is not rotating that fast, but it moves. And so the telescope has to point a star. And then if you want to observe it, for a long time, you need to track it and follow the object on the sky as it moves. And we have tons of those videos online. So if ever you want to check out the la latest video uh, from last night, you can uh, you can uh, take a snapshot of this uh, this um, uh, QR code and, and you, you'll access some of our videos. OK, so now that mirror. I wanted to show you a couple of things about that mirror because before I talk about my science, because we did something super cool during the pandemic. We did what we call the aluminization of the mirror. So every few years, we have to clean the mirror and basically put a new layer over the mirror so that it's super reflective and very, very shiny. And this is an old mirror. It was built in 1978. And this is what it looks like when there's uh, no shining coat on it. It's just a big piece of glass. And in 2020, during the pandemic, we all went to the summit in the dome and we had a briefing with our team. This is our team leader. He was preparing the day. We were gonna take that mirror off of the telescope, even though it's 12 ton heavy. It's a very, very heavy mirror. And we were gonna unbolt the telescope, take the mirror out, and bring it to a chamber inside the, the building. And so we have a big crane that helps us to move the telescope around. We have people checking things. And then we have a huge crane that is a, any, it, it, it's allowing us to take the mirror down to the first floor of the building. And there's five floors uh, inside that building. And uh, these videos shows uh, the mirror uh, as it's coming down um, to the first floor. And then we have another team that takes the mirror into that special room for its cleaning and resurfacing and just making it pretty. <laughs> and during that time, while there's a team preparing the mirror, we have other people that are actually on the structure of the telescope. This is where usually the mirror is installed. And we have what we call pucks. They um, just like pucks of hockey. Uh, and they have a little bit of the shape of a puck, you know, they are like, um, uh, flat and, 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 uh, and, and they're in the shape of a circle and we need to take them out because they hold the weight of the mirror all years long and so they really support a lot of weight and we need to make sure they are going to work for a long time so we take them out and we clean them and we reassemble them and we do all of this with huge number of people that are all specialized in different aspects of it you have the ladies here unrusting them, yeah, they're getting the rust out of them. And then you have some of uh, my coworkers, uh, they are completely taking them apart and cleaning each of the parts and then putting them back together. 
And here is my friend, uh, Les. He is uh, uh, the lead of the team there and he was testing them to make sure the pucks would be able to hold the weight of the mirror for the, another uh, three years. <laughs> and so while we were uh, cleaning those, uh, the other team had cleaned the mirror, uh, re redeposited a clean coat of aluminum on the surface of it and it was super shiny and ready to get on sky. And um, this process, I did not show you there, but if you're intrigued, we have like a, a time lapse of this process and you can, again, uh, take a snapshot of this QR code and, and go check out the video. It's about 10 minutes online. It's super cool. And you see the scientists around the mirror preparing, the, uh, preparing it for, for uh, the aluminization. And then it's all shiny and ready. We take it up back to the telescope and we reinstall it into the telescope structure. And so around, Doing astronomy, there's a lot of things. I am an astronomer, I study space. I use cameras. This is a picture of me pushing the camera. There's engineers that design those cameras. We have people around this that helps us move things, uh, make, uh, maintain the telescope or install the camera on the telescope. Uh, so there's mechanician, electrician, uh, there's people specialized in so, diff so many different things. And uh, we need everyone to make this work. <laughs> and Citel, the camera that I use, uh, is of course my favorite one. Uh, and I study galaxies with it. But at our telescope, we not only have Citel, we have other kinds of cameras. Some that takes images, like these two here, um, and some that takes the spectra, you know, those rainbow that I was talking about, but they just take one rainbow at a time of one star and they create those little signals here. Whereas Citel not only take rainbows, but it also take images. It's like a combination of the two. So it's a super powerful instrument that take both images and for each images it takes a rainbow so I can create a movie of what I'm looking at instead of just having like the data uh, to work with. I wanted to show you here, I'm gonna pause it um, right there. So the center of the galaxy, that big bright ball of light um, is actually billions of stars. We have, it, it looks like it's one gigantic star, but it is just billions of stars that are super close to each other. And they are so close that they look like one object, but it's just billions of stars. And if you would look closer and closer, you'd see each of them separately. And we're gonna keep going. And this is a tiny little galaxy that is actually rotating around the Milky Way, one of the Magellanic Cloud. And now we're going to go through the art of Andromeda, which is uh, our first neighboring ga big galaxy. It's a little bit uh, like the Milky Way. It's a disk spiral galaxy. It has a br big bright center with billions of stars. And as we move out, we see all of these galaxies around us. And there's billions of them as well in the universe. And they are super far away from each other, uh, millions of light years away from each other. It is, yeah, it is amazing how the universe is big and how those objects are far away. But nonetheless, we can see uh, their light using telescope. Excuse and- Excuse me. Yes. I have a question. Are all yes. of these white oh, dots uh, or like light uh, galaxies, Yes, so each little dots are galaxies like the Milky Way. They can be smaller, they can be bigger, but each little dots of light in that image right now is a galaxy that contains hundreds of billions of stars. And we don't know how many planets that can be around those stars. So it is amazing how big it is. You know, it's like mind blowing. And, um, but you know, like we're, we're gonna, like we're gonna check out a little bit of those galaxies today. I study a couple of them. I cannot study them all because <laughs> there's too many, uh, but I'm looking into some of the galaxies around us when I, when I look at the universe. And so you remember that uh, video of the cloud cam where we saw uh, the night sky? The object that you see in the night sky are stars inside the Milky Way in our own galaxy. Um, and if you could uh, actually see them all on a map, it would look like this. So each stars on that map is one of the stars that we see in the night sky. If you squish your eyes a little bit, you'll see there's like a band. Uh, yeah, it's over here where there's like more stars. And if you were looking at the night sky when it's super dark, let's say a night when the moon is not up, 
um, you could see the Milky Way. And this is a camera image, of course, of the Milky Way, so it looks really pretty. But with your naked eye, it would, would look more like this. So that band right there that looks a little bit more fuzzy is the Milky Way. So it's a disk, right? Like I showed on the video, so it's very flat. There's more star along that disk. And so you can see it in the sky like this. And my science is studying how stars are forming and how stars are forming in different galaxies. And when we look in the universe, you have different galaxies, they have different colors, different shape. Some of them are gigantic and like big balls of stars. Some are like spiral like these here. Some have a bar like this and they look very different. And some are more small and like irregular, not necessarily a peculiar shape. And each of them, especially, we can see it very well here. They have those red spots all around. And those red spots are where stars are forming in the nebulas. And sometimes they have weird form, like this one. <laughs> this one has a ring. And so I study these little red dots where we have newly formed stars in the gas. And um, I'm going to show you a simulation made by a computer. So when we know how the physics, uh, all the physics around star formation, and we can understand all the physics, the the, the force uh, that are involved, like gravity, and uh, we let those force interact with particles of gas in a nebula, we can understand how eventually the cloud of gas in the the Milky Way or other galaxies tend to form dense filaments of gas in which sometimes it gathers and the matter accumulate and form new stars. And this is all due to the force of gravity. And those little dots you see here are stars emerging from the nebulae. It could be 10, thousands of them form through the same cloud. And we call them sisters. They are formed through the same kind of material that was in the gas. Uh, the same atoms could be oxygen, nitrogen, and uh, nitrogen and other things like that. And when we look at them for real, so this is a simulation, but for real, it looks like this. So you have the cloud of gas and in the center, you have the newly formed stellar cluster, a cluster of little new stars. <laughs> and they're all sisters and they form through that process and they all form in different ways. Uh, so sometimes you have gigantic region like this one. This is the Tarantula uh, Nebulae. It contains supermassive stars and much bigger than the sun. Uh, and so what I try to understand is why sometimes nebulae enable the formation of gigantic stars, whereas sometimes it only forms super small stars. And each group of stars is different and they form in different areas of the galaxy. And uh, when they form, they heat up the gas and they create those bubbles, uh, very bright uh, bubbles of gas like this that I can study from super far away because they are bright. And um, okay, so I'm gonna uh, show you like why I'm doing this. Like, why is it important? Oh, there's a question, yes. Oh, um, I think we can, we, you can still continue. We'll take questions in okay. a couple more min moments. Okay. No worries. So why am I doing this? Why is it important to understand why uh, stars are forming and how? The reason why it is so important is that in our universe, stars have been forming since billions of years, since the Big Bang, since the formation of the universe. Um, the universe has transformed through time, mainly because of stars. Stars emit a lot of light. But not only that, when stars are formed in a cloud of gas like this, and they emerge, they are bright, they are emitting a lot of light. And the reason why is that in the very center of the stars, there's a process that is called nuclear fusion. It's a very fancy word to say that the stars are producing new elements, new atoms. They are fusing atoms that are small and they are creating larger ones, like the atoms of iron, for instance, it's a very large one. And so stars slowly create those larger atoms and eventually through their life, they return, oh, they return that gas uh, through the galaxy. And then these new elements are going to be recycled and are going to be used to create new stars. And eventually you form stars like the sun and you form planets like the earth that contain all of these elements. 
And so we are there today because of those generations of stars that have continuously formed new elements in the universe. So that's why it is so important. It really transformed the, the galaxies. Okay, and now this video shows a galaxy rotating. All of these little bright dots are uh, star forming uh, activity. Uh, those are acti actually taking a lot of time. This is accelerated very, very fast. A galaxy like this takes 250 million years to go around once, to spin on itself just once. It's 250 million years. And each of these little bright uh, dots that we see appearing and disappearing, they are star forming region and they live through about 40 million years. So uh, it is super accelerated. So these regions are super long lasting and a, a galaxy like our galaxy, the Milky Way is like a spiral. It looks very much like this. And this is what our galaxy is continuously doing, forming stars. And when a cloud is collapsing and forming stars, it takes 40 years before it gets a little bit uh, less bright and we stop seeing it. So I have as a scientist, about 40 million years <laughs> to catch when we have a region forming, forming stars. So the ones I am observing today uh, are basically, um, uh, yeah, they have been basically there since the, the dinosaurs were on Earth almost. <laughs> and so uh, it is amazing to see the time scales of uh, how long it takes for stars to form and, um, and how long also it takes sometimes for the light to come over here and for us to observe it. And I don't have, um, yeah, I have like about five minutes left. Uh, so I'm gonna show you a couple of things that I think is pretty cool and I wanna finish with that. So as a scientist, when I started working here, I was a young scientist and I really wanted to start my own project and make a difference, you know, learn something new about the universe that we didn't know before. So I decided to create a program that I called Signals. And SIGNALS is a program that study all these regions of star formation in galaxies, and it study them in different environments. So some of are in the very center of galaxies where it's super crowded, there's a lot of stars, lots of gas. Some are in an area where it's like quiet. You can compare it to maybe like a remote area, like um, uh, really like small town outside the city. <laughs> And each of them are actually in very, very different environments and galaxies. And I'm studying each of them to see what are the stars like? Are they like the sun? Are they bigger, smaller? Are they formed with the same kind of gas? Is there as much oxygen in the gas? Is there as much iron in the gas? And I study these and trying to understand how this is gonna impact the evolution of our galaxy. And I'm doing that very close to the Milky Way. So this is a uh, region inside the Milky Way. This is a galaxy close to us. And this is the kind of galaxy I study, very close to the Milky Way. But some other researcher uh, are studying objects super far away in the universe. And this is these galaxies you see in that image are super far away. And it can go even further away when galaxies become red and those little like dots that you see here are galaxies that are so far away. They are billions of light years away from us. And we can't see any details. We can barely tell what's happening in those galaxies. But with the study that I do with Signal, I can tell those researchers that are studying these little galaxies very far away from us. Well, I think that if you're observing this, 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 and that, well, you have time, like this amount of stars forming and they must be forming in these kinds of environment because I know it very well. I study galaxies that I can see uh, in our neighborhood and I can see them very well. So I'm helping with other researchers understanding super, uh, understanding super far away objects. And um, I'm gonna show you one last video. This is a video from the data I observed at the telescope of a part of this galaxy. And again, we're going to go through the different colors in that galaxy. So the video is kind of like you're looking through a rainbow. And you're going to see big flashes where the gas appears suddenly, like right there. The gas is appearing on the, the video because there's um, a signature from an atom that is very, very strong there. So when we see the hydrogen lighting up, it, it tells me how many hydrogen is there is everywhere in that galaxy. Sometimes it's the nitrogen that lights up. Sometimes it's the oxygen that lights up. And I can recognize those signature and know what it is in that galaxy. 
So it's a little bit like uh, the first rainbow I show you there when we're looking through the gas and seeing those little lines of colors. And I have many galaxies, so this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, and, and this one has like thousands of uh, star forming regions everywhere that's forming like so many stars as we speak. And it's even more active than the Milky Way. And some of the regions are gigantic, some are smaller. Uh, so it's really, really interesting. Uh, and there's so many things that I can do with that that I'm not doing this alone. So there's researchers from all around the world that helps me doing my work. I am uh, coordinating this effort. So I am the lead researcher, but we are now more than, than 60 to up to 70 researchers from all around the world in 17 different countries working on this. And hopefully in the next few years, uh, we'll be able to tell you a little more about how stars are forming and how it's going to impact the evolution of galaxies. And I have students working with me as well. So if ever you're interested, send me an email. I'm always happy to answer questions and also help students to make their own project in astronomy uh, from high school to university. So feel free, feel free to contact me and I will take your question. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a very exciting note to end on <laughs> and, and really uh, glad to hear that. Yes, that is something uh, for anyone who's interested. Uh, you can yeah reach out and, and maybe work on, on these projects. Um, we have lots of questions on Slido. So Prachi has actually brought that up. So um, we can dive right in. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, I can see it here. So how are the stars pushed away from the cloud of gas? Like you remember that simulation where I'm showing you the denser filaments and then those little points going a little bit in all direction. So uh, there's a it's a very good question because there's something that I didn't explain during that, that slide is that, um, you know, each stars that are formed in those clouds of gas, they interact with each other with gravity as well. And so just like the planets in the solar system revolves around the sun, those stars are close enough to be attracted by each other. And some of them can become what we call binary system where we have two stars rotating around each other. Uh, there's a lot of stars that are in binary system like this. About 70% of the stars ever formed are in those systems. But sometimes um, you have like super massive stars, like those super large ones that can be like a hundred times the mass of the sun. And those like act a little bit like a, sling, a gravity slingshot. So you can have some stars that pass very close to those super massive stars. And then they get attracted by their gravity and they pass super close to it. And then it launches them super far away. <laughs> and as it goes, as the interaction with gravity and the stars goes, you have more and more of those slingshot effects happening. And some small stars get projected around. And eventually, the cluster of stars dissipate. And some stars get um, yeah, distributed a little bit everywhere in the galaxy. OK. I'll big it is in feet. Oh my God, I cannot even use feet for that. So um, let's think those star forming region like this, these clouds of gas that are forming stars. There are some that are smaller, some that are bigger, but um, like an average one uh, would be about a hundred uh, light year. So a hundred light year, just to give you an idea of what it is. So light goes super fast, okay? It goes at about 300,000 meter per second. So every, uh, and not meter, but kilometer per second. So every second, the light can go through 300,000 kilometer. Uh, that's the distance between the moon and the earth. So every second, the light can just uh, be beamed on the moon. <laughs> and so one light year is the distance crossed by the light in one year. And there's a lot of seconds in a year. <laughs> so you can only imagine how big it is. It is a number that is so large that, that I cannot even like give, like it's, it's like one with like 15 zeros kilometer. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I wrote, we were just talking about this yesterday with our junior camp folks. So I just wrote in the chat window, we um, estimated a uh, light year is roughly 9.5 trillion kilometers. Perfect. There you go. That's a very precise number. <laughs> and uh, so, so uh, those clouds of gas are a hundred light years. So you multiply that by a hundred and you get it. <laughs> okay. Why did we take the mirror out of the telescope? Well, basically, 
the mirror have to be taken out sometimes it gets dirty but there's also with time um it gets get a little rusty basically so uh we are on the summit of the Mauna Kea. Uh, we have a volcano active not so far away there's a uh, some vag the the smoke from the volcano it contains some acids and stuff that really affects the quality of the mirror so through time it becomes less reflective so since the telescope is supposed to collect light if the mirror is not reflecting the light properly uh well we lose a lot of photons of light of particles of light um, that do not get reflected by the mirror so we clean it up we give it a fresh coat so that it becomes back to 100 percent efficiency and it's super uh, reflective and, and we can see object even better and to give you an idea, um, like sometimes we need to observe a galaxy for like an hour to be able to see things. So we have to stare at the galaxy for an hour to get the right amount of light. Once the mirror is re-quoted and refreshed, <laughs> we might only need 40 minutes to, to do the same thing because there's more light reflected by the mirror. So it really, really helps. So we do it every three years uh, and that's roughly like the best, the best, the best timing Okay, what are some of the major technical skills required in your job as an astronomer? That's a good question. We have different type of astronomers. So I am really like what we call an observer. I use telescope. I am hands on into those cameras that we use. So uh, good skills for, for me is, of course, you need to like computers. You need to like to play with data. We do a little bit of programmation. So learning to talk to the computer, learning uh, different software that are used uh, to analyze data and astronomy. Uh, doing your physics class uh, and 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 understanding the the physics and the the gravity and those force is important. You also uh, want to be able to think out of the box. You're a scientist. You need to be curious. You uh, you need to go check out things that have never been uh, looked before and think about ways to do it. So so that is very important for my work. And you need to be able to work in teams and connect with people from all around the world and 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 just coordinate everybody's efforts. I'm doing little parts of this. I'm helping another uh, student doing another part and I'm collaborating with another researcher doing uh, some other work and it, it is really important. And some astronomers are more on the theoretical or mathematical simulation uh, part of it. So I showed a couple of simulations on the computers. So we have astronomers that are solely focusing on simulating, knowing what we know from the universe, what is supposed to happen. And uh, we are su both super important because observers like me need to compare what they see with their data with simulation on computer and see if we are able to match the two of them. If we can simulate well observation, it means we really understand the physics of it. Okay, how big is the telescope in feet? Okay, so the mirror is 3.6 uh, meter, which would be like, let me check this out. It would be like about 12 um, feet wide, uh, maybe a little more. And, uh, you know, it's it's like in the dome, it is super tall. Um, so it is about the height of, I want to say, mm, almost eight men. So probably close to 50 feet high. Uh, it's pretty, pretty big. Okay, how can I pursue my passion for astronomy if I don't have a telescope? Well, you don't need a telescope. <laughs> we have telescopes for that. <laughs> so uh, I, I didn't have a telescope when I was young in my backyard. Don't be worried. I was using just my eyes to be like amazed by the night sky. And uh, there's, first of all, a lot of things you can see with your eyes. And also there's so many telescopes around the world that can be used to do astronomy and a lot of data is also available to the public. You can go on a website. For instance, we have the website in Canada called the CADC. So it's the Canadian Astronomical Database Center. And the Canadian Astronomical Database Center contained the data from uh, the telescope that we use and they are available to the public. And uh, okay, what got you interested in astronomy? Um, so that's a good question. I think without knowing what was what astronomy was when I was super young, I think I 
was already an astronomer like deep inside if ever i wanted to pick like a, a research project it was always a little related to astronomy uh i uh, remember doing uh, research on the planets of the solar system on the, the sun how the sun uh, is active uh, and then i went up to uh black holes neutron star very special objects and then eventually ended up doing my research on star formation and galaxies uh, but what got me interested, I think, is uh, being curious and also people supporting me, my family. Uh, they knew I was a scientist, probably more than I did, just because I was asking so many questions. So the support of my family, them knowing that I was eventually going to do science, uh, is probably what got me the most interested, just their support. Okay, what was the major event, unfortunately, that tuned your life upside down in a positive sense? Ah, so um, uh, like a good opportunity. So when I started Signal, I didn't know if the project was going to be accepted. So you can think of an idea, think of a project and think of science you can do, but you need that you need other people to believe in you. And Signal needed a lot of telescope time, a lot of time on the telescope to observe those galaxies. It's a four year project in which we actually observe 60 nights, complete nights on the sky, which is a lot of time. And so uh, I needed to go through uh, science committees that would say that my project was good and get accepted. And when it was accepted, I was so happy. It was like Christmas in the middle of the summer. It was in July of 2018, I can remember. <laughs> and uh, I knew I was gonna get my data and then I could do the science I wanted. So that was a major event for me getting getting the data for single knowing that my science was recognized and that we uh, we could do it. <laughs> Is it possible to study the moon with a small telescope, not a big telescope? Yes, you can study the moon. You know, one of the best moments where you can study the moon, but not only the moon, but use the moon to study other things is when you have a moon eclipse, a lunar eclipse. Those lunar eclipses are super cool because you get the shadow of the earth passing through the moon. And so the moonlight, the moonshine comes from the sun, right? Sun is basically hitting the moon, coming back on the earth. And so you have a little bit of information from the sun into that light, but also from the surface of the moon because it's bouncing back on it. And um, sometimes during an eclipse, you don't get the sunlight on the moon, but it's more the light coming from the atmosphere of the earth. So you can study the atmosphere of the earth through an eclipse. It is absolutely uh, amazing. So you get like both the information from the sun, from the atmosphere of the earth, from the composition of the moon. Uh, and you can still do this with a small telescope. If you have a camera, you can attach to it so you can measure something with a camera. You can even use your phone if you want. Um, okay, did you shine or lift the mirror? Um, so yeah, the mirror. Um, so um, how did we get it? So we have to lift the mirror up with those huge crane that I was showing because it's like 12 ton high. Um, and this mirror is like supported by those pucks like that, like I was showing and it constantly supports the weight of the mirror. And um, the mirror, you know, we, we don't brush it because brushing it would change a little bit of surface. So it has to be just laying there and we are trying to maintain it as clean as possible. Um, but after three years, it's not shiny anymore. So we need to literally use acids and we take out the, that coat of aluminum with acid and completely put a new one on it in a very special system where we deposit slowly aluminum on the surface. So we never really brush the mirror. <laughs> okay, how old is our galaxy? Super old. So uh, our galaxy was not necessarily as big as it was in the past. Um, it started like a small galaxy, like some other around us that are small. And then through interaction with other galaxies and gravity, it collected other galaxies. And we called those uh, events when the two galaxies collide together, we called them mergers. And the galaxy merged like that through their life. Um, but some of the stars in our galaxy, the oldest star that you can find in our galaxy are almost just as old as the universe. And um, back then, there was not a lot of heavy elements because they were the first stars. So there was no other stars before to have formed those heavier elements. So they're special. You can recognize them. And then it formed stars through all of its life. So we have a, 
uh, some stars that are 12, 13 billion years old. So it's about how old some part of our galaxy are, but we've been merging with more recent parts through the life of the galaxy. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll, thank I'll just quickly mention that we are officially at the end of our talk, but if you're okay staying back for a few more min minutes and answering some of these questions, um, yes. we'd love to have that continue. And, and if uh, <laughs> participants need to hop off, thank you for attending. And I'll give the official thank you uh, to our speaker for, for giving all of this wonderful insight. But um, yes. Yeah. Thanks everybody for being here. That was great. And I'm going to continue a few minutes answering those questions. Sure. And, uh, yeah, for sure. Go yeah. Ahead. <laughs> Let's go for another five minutes. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for the questions. This is great. <laughs> I love it. I really love answering questions. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, uh, Roger, okay. your screen has kind of, okay, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So you're working on a project, a coding project related to space weather any advice that's uh, like something um super interesting so depending on what your project is uh since it's related to space weather um i assume it's probably related to the state of the atmosphere sometimes we get like auroras and things that uh can you know affect our observation i know that um i use this personally some of the uh the tools that are online to do that and it's super important to know the, the condition in which you're going to observe uh if there's going to be other kind of light like auroras in the in the way when you observe and um and so if you are doing a project on that uh depending on which uh coding language you use you might be using python as a language to to code uh or others uh, python is very popular uh, make sure you connect with someone that also codes so that you can exchange tips. Uh, you don't want to do this alone. Sometimes you can be stuck uh, for just like doing a, a, a simple step because you don't know how to do it yet. Uh, but if you have a mentor close to you that can answer your quick questions so that you don't get blocked while writing your program, this is the best. And even here, when I work here and I'm coding a bit, you know, for my work and I'm analyzing the data, I have to code for this. If I have a, a if I'm blocked anywhere, I can ask my colleagues, hey, um, how do you do this? Have you ever done this before? And if not, then I look online. There's so many blogs and you can read about uh, about that and the experience of others. And um, I don't know if you're using the data that is already available online for your project, but there's so many data like database uh, that you can extract information out of to do cool projects. Uh, and usually the data is, is public. So uh, that, that would be my advice. But you can email me if, if there's anything more specific. Um, why are there so many galaxies? Oh, that's the question. The, like, I think the only answer I can give you is the universe is so big. We don't even know how big it is. Um, and it's just blow, mind blowing um, that there's like so much space and matter and galaxies. And the only thing we can see uh, around us is what we call the cosmologic horizon. So because the light even if the light goes super fast at 300,000 kilometers per second, um, there's a limit to what we can see around us because the light took as much as the age of the universe, basically, to get to us. So we cannot even see the whole universe. We only see a part of it. And so in the part that we see, we see those billions of galaxies. And so um, I don't know why, why it is so, <laughs> but... Um, there's a lot of energy, a lot of matter, and we are in there, just a tiny little part of it. <laughs> uh, don't some galaxy have super massive black holes in the middle? Yes, most of them. Most of the large galaxies like the Milky Way and the spiral galaxy and those little, uh, larger ones also that are like in um, like a, the shape of a, an ellipsoid or the, like a spherical shaped galaxy, those have massive black holes in, inside of them. Um, and by massive black holes, we're talking about black, black holes that are millions to billions of times the sun mass. It's gigantic. Uh, they are black holes, so you can't see them, but you can see what they do in their surrounding. They are uh, often active, and by active, I mean that they are accumulating matter. So there's matter falling onto the black hole and getting trapped. Could be gas, could be stars. When that happens, the black hole um actually show signs of activity it blinks and 
it sends jet into space. And those galaxy that contains those active black hole are, are called um, AGN or active galactic nuclei. Uh, and we see them in space. Uh, it's very common. They're a very powerful uh, object. Um, when will the next lunar eclipse happen? Um, I think. Oh, oh I've, I've written that in our chat. Is it in November? Yes. Yeah. Yes. November nineteenth, uh, I believe, and it's a partial. So, um, yeah, coming up. Yes. What are the two telescopes uh, named that take photos uh, of the stars? Oh, so uh, you probably mean the instruments. Um, so, um, yes, the. You know, at the beginning of the presentation, I was saying there was five different cameras, five different instruments at our telescope. Uh, some are only taking the rainbow, so they are looking at one star at a time, but very precisely. Uh, and those are called Spiru and Espadons, and they are what we call high resolution spectrograph. This is like super fancy technical words, I know, uh, but just to like basically explain what they do. Um, so they split the light from one star as a rainbow. Um, and you know, with our eyes, when we look at a rainbow, we see like, well, six or seven colors, depending on who you ask to. Um, but those cameras are able to split the light in so many different colors um, that they see hundreds of thousands of colors within the rainbow. And this enables you to see so many different colors that if there's a signature of every little element you can think of, and even sometimes molecule like water or di uh, carbon dioxide and things like that, well, these type of instrument can see that through the rainbow. And those are Espadons and Spiru. And they see slightly different rainbows. Not gonna go into details, but you can go check online on our website. <laughs> um, why do stars form more around the edge of galaxies instead of the center? It does look that way, uh, that they, they form more in the outskirt, uh, but it's actually like an illusion. Um, they actually form a lot in the center as well, but there's so many stars in the bulge of the galaxy that you can't see as well the gas because it's just like contrast, it's so bright, you don't see it as well. But when, once you start studying it, you realize actually there's a lot of stars that form in the center and they have more heavier elements, you know, more uh, product from those other generations of stars that are in there. Because of that, it makes them a little less brighter but they are as numerous and uh, sometimes as massive, sometimes not, uh, because they don't have the same composition. They have heavier elements inside of them. Uh, so it can be very counterintuitive sometimes, uh, but yeah, and there's a lot of stars that are forming in the outskirts and we can see it so well because there's nothing else around <laughs> and it looks like uh, very intense, but it is also in intense in the centers. Where can I access those amazing footage of galaxy rotating, star forming, et cetera? Um, most of the footage that I can uh, use um, sometimes are available on YouTube. Uh, I would be happy to share the links to them. Uh, they are available for public, available for, uh, for public presentation, free presentation, and things like that. Uh, they are also, most of them are also produced by research team that are doing simulations. Um, so often when you go to the link, you can see which team is actually working on those video and uh, what they were uh, trying to see while they were producing those video and things like that. Um, um, I could I could make a suggestion perhaps if you want to email us with those links, we can send yeah. to everyone who signed up for today's talk and that way. Everyone gets that, even if they were had to hop off uh, a bit earlier. So uh, yeah, I'll be happy great. to do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you uh, provide? Uh, Maybe add that as well in the email. <laughs> and I'm super easy to find. If you go on the website, the Canada France Hawaii Telescope uh, website, um, there's a, a staff um, section, and I'm in the astronomy section of the staff. <laughs> you can find Ooh. me there, and uh, yeah. my email is available there. Um, can you please suggest an astronomy project middle school student can get involved in? Um, so I would probably go into studying um, either images or one single spectra or a couple of spectra of stars. The data I work with, uh, the CITEL data, uh, can get 
a little uh, intense in volume, like it's literally millions of rainbows, millions of spectra at a time. Uh, I'm also happy to provide some, like some smaller samples of data, but I would definitely go into the Canadian Astronomical Database Center, uh, try to extract images of uh, some objects that you like. Uh, most of them have been observed, uh, especially the nebulae in the Milky Way that are close by. Uh, you can also extract images in different colors and different filters. So you can see what the nebula look like in the blue, in the red, in the green. And even though it's not doing the rainbow, it's kind of like doing a very uh, rough analysis of the composition still because the elements are different in the red and the blue and in the green. And so um, you can do the same kind of analysis with images, just a little less precisely. And it can be super interesting for students. Just keep it like uh, a little bit more uh, simple with the filters and the colors at the beginning. And then you can jump in uh, for spectra a little bit later. <laughs> Yeah, I, I added the, the database that you mentioned, and I also wrote down about the, the Galaxy Zoo, Zooniverse community, where they have that yeah. for like citizen science uh, projects and, and ways to kind of work on astronomy um, yeah. content. Yeah. And I have a colleague here that is uh, doing a little GUI uh, online where you can load an image in the different colors and you can actually play with the color range so you can do your own pretty space oh, image that the would way be you good. like. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'll send that link as well. Sure. <laughs> um, okay. What is the biggest galaxy in the universe? Um, there is a couple of galaxies that are super massive and usually they are in the center of what we call galaxy clusters. Uh, there's groups of galaxies that are attracted to each other. I don't have like a precise name. I have actually, uh, yeah, I have a couple of names I could give you, but just to give you a rough number, those are like the, the largest ones are thousands of times the mass of the Milky Way. So imagine a galaxy a thousand times bigger than ours. Um, that's how big and massive they are. And those galaxies usually don't have any spiral structure. They are like those gigantic ball of stars, like boom, and they have like bright stars and they are like, yeah, more spherical and don't have a lot of structure inside of them, like the spiral arms and, and the bulge in the center and things like that. Um, and um, yeah, um, I think Malin is Malin, I can't remember if it's Malin one or two. It's a name of a big spiral galaxy um, that is known to be very large and um, still containing a lot of gas. So that's a special one. So if ever you wanna go see and find a very peculiar galaxy, uh, that's a very big spiral one. Um, are there um, such as white holes, if so? What if uh, it mixed with black holes? Ah, okay, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, so uh, some people were uh, basically putting theories that um, somewhere in the universe, there might be something that would be like the opposite <laughs> of a black hole where uh, you'd have energy and matter coming out. Um, and um, We've never seen any. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, if they exist, they could be very, very small to the point where we cannot detect them. Um, and um, like a black hole, like if I want to add a little something like into the mystery, like <laughs> black holes can be like super big and sometimes super small. And black hole usually, you know, accumulate mass, you know, and grab stuff and it falls into the black hole and it gets trapped in, inside of it um for because of the force of gravity mainly but uh when a black hole gets is small very small um it is possible to have a very very tiny black hole and those black holes are not very stable for a long time they tend to emit a little bit of light here and there and and they dissipate basically just by losing a little bit of energy and the smaller they are the more they lose their energy fast so you can kind of see them, those tiny little black holes, as if they were white holes uh, in a sense. <laughs> um, so that was space of pollution. Yes, unfortunately, there's so many things in space. Um, and um, we sometimes need to think about cleaning it. <laughs> but yeah, and I, I will have to stop there. Uh, I have uh, I have to meet someone. No but 
Yes, I will send the links um, that I was talking about as soon as I can later today. Sure. And again, thanks a lot for your questions. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending all this extra time as well answering all of these questions. I know everyone was uh, pretty once once they started coming. Oh yeah, I'm seeing a heart reaction too. <laughs> awesome. Uh, thank you again, and and hopefully we can have you uh, join us another time uh, down the road. Yeah, my pleasure, of course. Bye, Thank everybody. you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.